Hey everyone, my name is Dr. Christopher Yandel and I am one of the Emerging Scholar Award recipients for this year's conference. And I am here to present part of my dissertation research, understanding the lived academic experiences of NCAA Division I football student athletes. So to introduce this study, uh, the academics athletics power struggle within intercollegiate athletics has been an ongoing tug of war that has spanned more than 150 years, and it has become increasingly visible in NCAA Division I athletics, and the student athletes are faced with this ongoing internal and external struggle as to which A is more important. Is it the academics or is it the athletics? So for the problem, and there were a lot of problems trying to uh, distill this study down into one statement was difficult, but I think I was able to hone it in on this one. From Settle, Sellers, and, and Damas from 2002, quote, academics is often competing for the time of athletes involved in revenue producing athletics like football and basketball. Unfortunately, school often comes second because the stakes are so high, end quote. The primary focus on college sports has deviated away from education as its mission is now focused more on glamour and athleticism. So the purpose, the purpose of this phenomenological study was to explore the internal and external factors that have contributed to these lived academic experiences and perceptions of academic success for football student athletes at one NCAA Division I football bowl subdivision institution and one football championship subdivision institution. And for those that may be watching that are not familiar with that setup, um, in college athletics in the United States in Division I, uh, it's divided into two. The top tier of 130 schools play in bowl games and they play for the college football championship, thus the bowl subdivision. The other part, the other 120 some odd teams play uh, an actual playoff of 16 teams, thus they are in the football championship subdivision. So from here on out, you'll hear me reference FBS and FCS. So my design, uh, it was created within a transcendental phenomenological design. Uh, phenomenology is the study of the human experience. And it was a philosophical approach to qualitative research seeking to understand the human experience, according to Moustakas, 1994. And I did this all through an interpretive, interpretative lens. And interpretative, interpretativism is the belief that reality exists within a participant's reflection, self-description, and their interpretation of the data. So in looking for a theoretical framework, um, I combed through hundreds and hundreds of, of articles and books, and I finally found the self-fulfilling prophecy. And it was derived from a sociological theorem formulated by Thomas and Thomas in 1928. And it was really developed and defined and identified by Merton as the false definition of the situation evoking a new behavior which makes the originally false conception come true. Um, and that's where the light bulb moment came on for me that these athletes, do they believe in the self-fulfilling prophecy? Is that how they identify themselves academically or athletically? So taking it a step further, further stereotypical thinking and prejudgments from faculty led to a self-fulfilling prophecy affecting both learners' academic and social performances in a study by Parks and Kennedy. Those negative biases may cause students to become entangled in an ongoing spiral where less is expected of them and less is produced by them, which confirming the original expectations of the perceiver results in a self-fulfilling prophecy. So this led me to three research questions. The first one, how do Division I FBS and FCS football student athletes perceive themselves within their academic experience? Number two, how do these student athletes negotiate their academic lives within the boundaries of their ath athletic demands? And then three, 
what are the differences in academic experiences among the FBS and FCS football student athletes? Is there more demands at the higher level of division one than there are at the lower level of division one, or are they really the same? So my population, I wanted scholarship football student athletes who are academically eligible to compete, meaning you only need a 2.0 GPA or higher to be academically eligible, according to the NCAA. They must have completed at least two semesters of academic coursework at their institution. I didn't want players who had just finished high school last week and enrolled in college. They wouldn't have the feeling of what it was like to be a college student or a football student athlete for a whole year. I wanted somebody that had been indoctrinated within the system for a year to have a full grasp and have been through the system for a year to give really a sense of how they'd experienced everything. And then I had limited the population to division one football student athletes for these three reasons. One, division one is the only classification that is required to provide academic support services for student athletes. It's also division one schools participate at the highest level where revenue generation and winning games are more important than the division two and division three schools and division one football student athletes total time commitment to athletics adversely affects other aspects of their life. So how did I select these participants. I use purposeful sampling in selecting them. Uh, I provided my suggestions to each of my key informants at both institutions and then my key informants at each institution scheduled the interview times for me. So I adhered to the IRB requirements and submitted all of my documents and protocols to Mercer University. Um, because these interviews were informal and an interactive process, I followed a semi-structure interview protocol um, that included 15 questions, which also allowed me some flexibility um, with follow-up questions as well as I knew each um, participant would give me their own unique different perspective with how the questions were structured. So the research sites for the FBS school, Metro University, uh, it was private, non-sectarian, uh, meaning it's not affiliated with a religion. It's one of 130 FBS schools. You can see how the enrollment breaks down. Um, it is a considered a large four-year institution in a highly residential setting. And you could see with City College, I tried to match the schools as close as possible in size. I wanted them, I wanted to compare apples to apples. I did not want to compare a private school to a public school because I knew the findings could be skewed. Um, and with public institutions, they're not as open as to letting student athletes to be research subjects for projects such as this. So private institutions were the best way for me to go. Study participants. These were the five for Metro University. Uh, I gave them pseudonyms. Um, the first name, the first letter of their pseudonym um, is the letter of their real name. So David, Caleb, Josh, Corey, and Kevin. Um, I identified their race, their athletic year, their academic year, and their major. Same thing for City College. Um, when was all said and done, out of the 10, seven were black, three were white, so 70 to 30, a little bit higher percentages than on average. In Division I, it's about 55% black to 45% white in Division I football. So I tried to get it as close as possible. Uh, but athletic year and major and academic year uh, gave me a good wide spread um, of the participants and the population. So these were the five themes out of the data that were developed. Uh, the five themes were identity, academic experience, athletic experience, culture and social growth, and interpersonal growth. Um, however, the, the two main areas that I focused on in the majority of my data ended up being identity and academic experience. And for, um, for this research, it's going to be mostly academic experience and those sub themes of academic roller coaster, balancing athletic and academic demands, relationships, course and degree selection, stress, and college coursework. So, 
what did these participants say? There was so much data and trying to distill it down into something that I can present in the 20 minutes was hard. And I'm more than welcome to share the entire paper with anyone who's interested. But to break it down by question, uh, how do the student athletes perceive their academic experience? Um, David acknowledged he bit off a little bit more than he could handle um, because he went to a magnet high school and he thought he could handle the rigor of both athletics and academics when he got to college. Um, for Josh, the time between his high school and graduation to the start of college were simply a number of days. And he chose to attend this private FBS school because if you succeed academically, it'll rub off, you, rub off on you in the future. And then Corey said he was growing as a student because college is like the real world in which there's not going to be someone telling you, hey, you got to do this, you got to do this. So in going to research question number two, I found this interesting in that each of the 10 participants shared that time management organization were critical in how they balance academics and athletics. Additionally, they all said they were able to balance this because at both institutions, football practice, meetings, film, everything was scheduled for the morning and all of their classes were scheduled afterwards. And I found that really interesting that that was, and they all mentioned something along the lines that they were better able to structure their days and schedule their lives because football was all handled in the morning and school and everything else was done afterwards and they were better able to organize. Uh, Caleb went on to further say that student athletes learned quickly that they were three pillars. And this was probably one of the better quotes of all the data, um, athletics, academics, and social life. But you can only pick two, like a three-way Venn diagram. And then each of the five participants at City College credited those morning football demands on helping them better organize. Um, their demands and managing their time. And then with research question number three, um, half of the study's participants said they would change either some of their courses they took in college or wish they were better informed about the choices in academic majors. Um, despite the difference in school size, size and academic offerings, there were few differences in the experiences of the study participants. A notable similarity among the participants was the adjustment from high school to college. Many of them said they had to grow up quickly and they didn't have high school teachers constantly on them to tell them what to do. So with theme one being identity, um, black student athletes have been plagued by the dumb jock stereotype for decades. However, none of the participants have experienced ill effects of a dumb jock stereotype during their time in college. No participants said they had been re uh, the recipient of negative comments from a professor, which would contradict a previous study that found more than 60% of student athletes reported negative remarks made in class. The seven black participants exhibited no signs of being adversely affected by unjust faculty expectations, as suggested in previous research. With theme number two, academic experience, None of the participants said their football participation precluded them from pursuing an academic major. In fact, three of them, David, Corey, and Aaron, said their school did not have the academic major they initially wanted, so they settled for something similar. And then according to the 2019 roster on Metro University's athletics website, 47% of its football players were declared majors in the program within its school of business. One black participant, Aaron, has already graduated from City College with a bachelor's degree and the other six participants were on schedule to graduate from their institutions within their five-year eligibility window. Theme three, athletic experience. Many studies have explored the long-term effects of college football student athletes experiencing injury. While there is no available research about the effects of a redshirt season on college student athletes, all 10 participants experienced some form of resilience during their college career from a redshirt season to overcoming injury to overcoming personal struggles. Out of the 10 participants, seven of them identified either an injury or a redshirt season as being a setback to them wanting to give up or them um, thinking about 
their choices about transferring or um, second guessing some of their decisions, which I thought was quite interesting. Recommendations for future research. Um, there are obviously several points here, um, but I think the few that I want to get across, there's a gap in research on freshmen, redshirt freshmen, or student athletes that have endured a redshirt season. Um, I certainly think there's future research needed in this area, considering the, the amount of participants that mentioned how much a redshirt season affected them um, negatively, mentally at first, but they realized looking back how much that redshirt season was really beneficial for them. Um, additionally, there's still much research to be done in order to understand the lived academic experiences of other Division I student athletes, not just football. Uh, we've seen a lot of research on football and basketball, but other sports, baseball, women's sports, softball, volleyball, soccer, tennis, the Olympic sports, non-revenue sports, these are all areas that are of utmost importance. And then outside of the football ecosystem, um, future research with men's and women's basketball, which, partic which participate in the other high-profile revenue sports, there could be room for additional studies as well. So in summary, why did I choose this area? Some of the stories that I heard, they were validated by what were told to me. I had heard some of these throughout my career and the stories these participants told, they validated what I already knew. On the flip side, there were stories shared by them that challenged the intrinsic biases that I had accumulated during my career. And at the end of each interview, it reminded me that most college football fans don't see these athletes as people, but they see them as merely entertainment products. And that's the one thing I miss most about working in athletics is working with these individuals as humans and as students. And then finally, the student athlete term. Um, I did not want to use it at any point in this dissertation. However, there was no academic literature that's, that I cited that did not use the terminology. Uh, Shulman and Bowen did not use it in their book, and it was, in fact, a word created by Walter Byers himself. Um, and then I closed my dissertation by stating that I believe that the term student athlete can be viewed as a derogatory term that is, as it is not an accurate depiction of life in collegiate athletics. So with that, uh, I want to thank you for your time. And if you're interested in my complete paper, you're more than welcome to contact me. And thank you again. And I look forward to seeing everybody next year.